Thank you, Chris. So we have our panel discussion. So I was going to ask um, Lily Dara and Bashoa Yanni to join the group. Uh, Lily's from USC and Bashoi from UCLA Santa Monica. All right. So we'll start with Paul. So uh, two questions for Bruce. Mike Charlton presented the uh, debrief. I don't know at the end of AASLD if you saw that. No. Okay, so he recovered the telepressin data and seemed to imply that the study failed because it didn't change survival. And um, I thought he got it wrong because I thought the whole idea was to just show that you could bridge, use telepressin to bridge um, to transplant and that you need less dialysis and that your creatinines were improved. And, and Chris, and uh, you can comment also, is that your impression? I mean, that's what the study was designed to do, not change survival. Right, it improved renal function at the expense of more sepsis but I think 20% uh, RRT after transplant is a worthwhile goal in itself. So uh, it's hard to show that a drug uh, improves survival treating a complication of advanced cirrhosis. You improve their renal function and they have variceal hemorrhage and die or HCC right. and die. So yeah, that's my impression also. Uh, you know, there wasn't any written information basically about this, so you had to go and listen to the abstract. So I think uh, we'll see the full paper eventually. The prior study, which Icaria was convinced would get FDA approval, they had drugs sitting in warehouses ready to go, and the FDA said no, because it didn't have this, it didn't meet this crazy uh, reduction of creatinine less than 1.5 twice over 24 hours or right, so. Right, right. So it didn't meet that. Uh, but the rumor is it, it will get FDA approval. So, I, I Chris, do you agree? <clears throat> yeah, you know, I, I, I totally agree. I think uh, having participated as an investigator in all those trials, like many of us here, several things stand out. First of all, once a patient has developed that multi-organ failure syndrome, uh, to ask for improvement in survival doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is if you just look at the population that being enrolled in these trials, because of the increased prevalence of metabolic syndrome and CKD at low grade in the general population, it's not clear to me that we're even seeing that same clean cohort of type 1 HRS any longer. And I think it's very unfortunate this drug is still not available in this country because uh, as, you know, as many of you know, um, octreotide, uh, is associated with tachyphylaxis within five minutes. And this was shown in a very nice paper in hepatology in 2011, where they actually measured azagous blood flow. And most of the, 98% of the octreotide we're giving to patients is actually placebo. Mm. And if you really want to use octreotide, what you should do, in my opinion, is turn it off and turn it on about five minutes before you do your endoscopy and then do your banding. So that's just my personal view. So I think this is a big challenge. Terlipressin is, in fact, the only drug that truly increases um, splanchnic blood flow and causes some level of vasoconstriction. So, uh, so I think that this is, uh, this is a very important drug and we need to have it available. And it's obviously inexpensive and it's been used in other countries for a long time. It's the standard of care in the yeah, whole absolutely. world except the United States. Yeah. We're I, still using MOA based on seven patients. So yeah, I do have a study. question for Bruce. I was very intrigued about your albumin comment. And one of the things we've noted in the terlipressin trials was that you had to fail albumin replacement before you could actually qualify for the trial. And a lot of patients failed, screen, failed because they had not gotten adequate albumin. And when you give albumin in that setting of AKI, a lot of times their kidney function improves. So do you think in that population albumin may have a role? Or? Sure. Sure. For differentiating volume depletion from a renal is the standard of care. Sure. That's the setting where I use it. 
as a gram per kilo per day for two days, 100 grams max. Uh, Turley's been available in Germany since 82. And when I was recruiting patients from Europe to California, they would come here and say, where the heck is the Turley press at? What, we need this Turley press at, because they were so used to it, and they'd given up on octreotide. So that's Barcelona data saying octreotide doesn't work. I certainly use it, uh, but the, the, you know, the, the Barcelona people just don't think it's worth the darn because of the tachyphylaxis. So I'm hoping this will see the light of day finally, you know, 82 till now, it's just unbelievable the U.S. doesn't have it. But uh, I think it's probably coming. Malincrot, you know, is bigger pharma than Icaria, and will probably help get this through. Mm. The last question for anybody on the board, or everybody, is we uh, recruited a new, young, aggressive, interventional guy uh, from New York who says he can measure portal pressure by EUS and, well, and liver biopsy by U.S., and sure, that he doesn't sure. get bleeding, because he can see the vessels. Yep. So I want to know if any of you guys at USC or UCLA or anybody have somebody doing that. It's mostly Ken Chang at UC Irvine, and he calls this interventional hepatology. <laughs> so he, you know, he had, uh, there's, there's European data sh showing that you can put a TIPS in by EUS in pigs. So he's uh, poised to put TIPS in himself by EUS. He has to stick the portal vein to get the pressure. But if you're sticking it from parenchyma, there should be minimal chance of bleeding. Is anybody doing this at USC? Or? Well, um, I know that Ara Sahakian can do it, but the, um, I, Jeff may speak to it better at Keck maybe. But um, we haven't been actually ordering them because I think the specimen will be too small because they use really tiny needles to get it. And you know, for a good core biopsy, I still prefer a transabdominal if the patient doesn't have risk factors. Or, yeah. Uh, we haven't been doing pressure measurements, no. Yeah, as far as I know, no one does uh, uh, pressure measurements at UCLA through EUS. Uh, liver biopsy has been done, but very similar experience uh, to USC. Um, the, the, there's never enough um, uh, tissue um, uh, to look at. And then so, you'll, you'll end up doing multiple passes if you want enough, and it's just too, too small. Yeah, the thing about the bi so in Seattle, we're not measuring pressures that way. But you could even potentially, there was a study from Germany about five years ago, or maybe even longer, that you could use an occlusion balloon and non-invasively transduce the pressure in the varix. Um, I don't know why it never really took off here, because that would be non-invasive. The issue with the biopsies is that it's becoming very, very hot among um, interventional endoscopists, <clears throat> but the maximum you can get is a 19 gauge. But they can get unbelievable numbers of cores that are like that long, but it's, you cannot get anything bigger than a 19 gauge needle into the channel. So for those of us that do trials and are interested in NASH and other things where you need a 16 gauge biopsy, I don't know if that's gonna be possible. Yeah, this, uh, this is for uh, Bruce. Um, there was recently a convening in Bavano, <laughs> Italy, uh, in an attempt to reduce the amount of uh, uh, unnecessary endoscopies in patients. Yep with cirrhosis, and their original criteria, uh, I believe, was 150,000 platelets uh, and um, a uh, KPA of 20, and they've recently extended this to a point where they've dropped it down to 110,000 platelets and a KPA of 25, so the, the, according to their data, uh, patients with a KPA less than 25 and patients currently with a platelet count greater than 110 would, uh, would not be needing an endoscopy. And I wonder how that sort of fits in with your I, sense. I think that's real. Uh, unfortunately, alcoholic liver disease gives you the most normal spleen size. We published a paper on that. and gives you the most normal platelet count. So platelet count is not very good for alcoholic liver disease. It's good for non-alcoholic of all types, not very good for alcoholic liver disease. 
and the, you know, the, the U.S. Uh, limit should be 160. So if it's below 160, there should be a red flag there uh, saying this is abnormal. 150 is too low. To, to have all these patients between 150 and 160 get missed, potentially. But I've seen low platelet count get missed for years in these patients, and then they develop something clinically relevant. So Bovino is great. It's European-based. Garcia sounds the main American who usually goes with this also, and I think that's useful information. Uh, they just, uh, the Europeans just published, I think, 64-page uh, paper guideline on, on liver, on cirrhosis, basically. 64 pages. They tried to cover almost everything. So I think they're ahead of us. They've been, a, Europe's been ahead of us for forever, uh, for whatever reason. I think it's Rodez and Sherlock that really made that happen. So Rodez spent some time with Sherlock. So, uh, you know, there's zero liver ICUs in the USA, zero. There's 10 liver ICUs in Europe, London, Barcelona, et cetera. So why not have a liver ICU where you're not fighting with the ICU critical care team to do things, uh, to avoid things and do what you want. If you have someone you work with regularly who only sees liver failure, they're gonna get better and better and better treating those patients. But if you look at what percentage of patients in the US in the ICU have cirrhosis, it's three to 7%. So small, they get treated like everybody else, they expect the same MAP goal, on and on and on, and they end up harming these patients. Put them on sedation for ventilation and they have a high dose instead of what should be a very, very low dose. So we need better care of these patients and, and Europe has been ahead of us. It's, it's, you know, we have a lot of money, why aren't we uh, ahead of them? Uh, but uh, that's just reality in my opinion. Thank you. You discussed medications in cirrhotics um, that we overuse or underutilize. Can you comment on medical marijuana as every patient seems to be admitting to it or using it? Yes, I think, uh, again, it's, it's the sequential addiction phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You say, stop drinking, and they say, okay, I'll, I'll just get high instead. So, uh, and, and now it's, a, you know, it's proven Colorado, people go to Colorado to buy marijuana over the counter basically, and then they, they're supposed to keep it in Colorado, you're not supposed to come back to New Mexico with it. So I think, you know, it's clean and sober is the goal. And medical marijuana, I think, is probably not uh, advisable. Uh, many transplant programs won't transplant someone with positive uh, THC in their urine. So it's just another addiction that I think we should probably uh, d discourage. So a lot of the patients, for example, have arthritis and we can't use narcotics, we avoid the NSAIDs. And then in California that we can use the, you know, marijuana, yeah. do you advise against? Well, you have to individualize that. And uh, if they remain functional on marijuana, maybe it's okay. Uh, but many people get stuck and all they wanna do is smoke or eat marijuana and they have no life because of that. So, I don't know in California. Oh, I don't think they work personally. People I know bought them like a hundred dollars for an ounce or something. Tried it, tried it, tried it. Didn't work. So I think uh, mer medical marijuana you can consider in a patient. CBD oil I wouldn't count on. Lidocaine patch has been ignored, and I've had some success with the lidocaine patch. So that's something to consider. These patients. I'm not aware of any problem with that. Not addictive, et cetera. I, I work in, a, um, in Beverly Hills where the clientele is affluent and uh, they all seem to be using marijuana and they're all functional and highly functional. Good, good. So I'm happy to hear that. Are they, are they dri driving in LA? Yes, Hi. they are, yes they are. Yes they are and it's unrealistic to think that they're not. So I think well, maybe their attention span is less and they're texting less, but I'll, I'll make a little plug. Um, I'll make a little plug for, I'm chair of the uh, ASLD special interest group clinical practice. Um, so anybody who's interested, you're a member of ASLD, please consider join, joining our SIG. We put on a meeting every year, we put on a lot of content, and we put on webinars, 
And there's an upcoming webinar by um, Drs. Kongli and Kiltekian from Canada on two topics. For the hepatologists, what you need to know about cannabis and, um, and the uh, possible uses of marijuana in the patient with liver disease. So it's just a webinar. You can, you know, I don't know if you can get it as a podcast. We're working on it. Just a little plug there. Uh, it's exactly what you're asking about. So. I think all we can do is try. The patients do what they want, regardless of our advice, a good share of the time. So uh, the, pr the proof is in the pudding. If they're, if they're using marijuana and they're functional, in your opinion, no car accidents, whatever, they can still balance their checkbook, et cetera, maybe it's okay. I, I have never prescribed marijuana, but there's a lot of interest in that. When I found out I had pre-glaucoma, and I told my college buddy, the first words out of his mouth were, well, you can get medical marijuana now. But I haven't pulled that trigger yet. <laughs> Don't plan to, yeah. I think one thing we have to always remind our patients is uh, that marijuana and CBD, although legal, are not really highly regulated at this point. Uh, then, then there is no, there is no um, way to really know how these uh, compounds are synthesized, where they're synthesized, um, what drug-to-drug -drug interactions are are there. Um, I mean, if they take the medical marijuana or CBD oil with their statin, does anyone know what happens? Does that increase the risk of rhabdomyolysis? In fact, uh, um, in, in my practice over the past year and a half, I have seen two young uh, patients who received CBD oil, um, you know, for, for pain and, and uh, energy and whatnot. Uh, both uh, got jaundice. This was the only thing that they were um, that they were taking. Uh, we stopped the CBD oil, monitored the liver tests, and uh, it came. It, they came back down to normal again. Um, another thing with smoking marijuana and the vaping of marijuana is that if the plant is not taken care of appropriately by the growers, um, a lot of we we live in California, and one of the biggest things, even on the board exams, is coxie. Uh, so fungal fungus grows on the plant itself. And as the patients inhale it, especially if they have cirrhosis or liver disease, uh, it's a direct um, entrance into the lungs um, and into the bloodstream. Um, and some patients in Bakersfield, at least, where I did some of my medical school rotations, um, have gotten um, neurocoxy uh, due to inhaling uh, uh, and smoking uh, marijuana. Uh, that was not very uh, well taken care of um, in the plant. So have, you, we have to be uh, very cautious about full-heartedly or even half-heartedly talking to our patients, telling our patients that uh, marijuana would be uh, okay to use. I think a lot of us feel forced in that direction uh, because uh, it is now becoming more legal and more relevant but we have to remember and realize there are no large uh, clinical studies. Uh, there is a possibility of harm. We don't know uh, of any robust benefit. So that first, do no harm. So we're not really sure if it causes harm and therefore we should not. Uh, I, 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 I agree. You may want to publish your experience with that, the jaundice experience. It, there are papers published on systemic fungus in patients smoking marijuana, especially post-transplant. So some transplant programs refuse to transplant patients with a positive THC in the urine because of this risk of systemic fungus post-transplant. So I, I agree with you. I think it is do no harm. And the current marijuana is so much more powerful than the 60s stuff, like 50X powerful. So patients, you know, get high with much less exposure, but I think better regulation is is needed to prevent the fungal uh, colonization of the marijuana. Uh, what's the role of uh, octreotide in acute variceal bleeding and long-acting octreotide to control recurrent bleeding from PHG and hepatic hydrothorax? Oh, for hepatic hydrothorax, I think octreotide, it's hard to get because you order it, the pharmacy says, does this patient have carcinoid? You say no, then they say no, octreotide. So especially as an outpatient, it's like $1,500 a month or something, self-injection. So it's just not practical and usually doesn't get paid. So 
I use it for variceal bleeding in the absence of anything else. But once we have Turley for hepatorenal, I think it'll be used for variceal bleeding 10x for the hepatorenal indication. So I think it's, I hope it's coming and I, I hope it will do what, what these uh, trials have told us it will do. Yeah, in, in regards to uh, CBD oil, uh, we've been having a lot of problems in the post-transplant clinic. We started to notice that patient that CBD oil interferes with the tacrolimus level, which is the, and the calcineurin inhibitors that they take for immunosuppression. So uh, we uh, really uh, go crazy trying to monitor their levels with the CBD oil. So now uh, we are prohibiting any uh, uh, CBD oil at least, and we are working on uh, new uh, um, guidelines for uh, post-transplant and uh, marijuana use. Good plan, mm -hmm. yeah. CBD and, oils yeah. like 0 0.05 percent mm -hmm. CBD, so it's so dilute, I'm surprised. Mm -hmm. They must be bathing in it to mm -hmm. end up with a high <laughs> tack level. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and some people probably do, it, there's a big placebo effect. Mm -hmm. So patients who start it, they think it's working initially, and then they realize it, it really isn't. So the people I know who use CBD oil end up stopping it. <laughs> And it's so expensive. Uh, it came out of the woodwork. I'd never heard of it until maybe two years ago, and now it's everywhere. Lots of commercials uh, for it, places that sell it. So it's, it's legal marijuana, and there must be some threshold of concentration that makes it illegal. So it's really, really very dilute. But that's a scary observation, Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also in regards to uh, measurement of the portal uh, pressure uh, by endoscopic ultrasound, you know by the paper from uh, Roberto Grossman, he says that even the abdomen has to be even uh, without ascites because if not, that's uh, uh, anything in the abdomen is going to uh, influence in, on the measurement of the vena cava pressure, which is the point of reference. So yep. if, uh, if you put an endoscope inside and you start measuring the portal pressure, I think that's going to be not very accurate. And, yep. uh, and again, with the, with the radiologist, I, I agree. Sometimes they, we send for a tips. They measure the, the, the gradient is seven, and they do the tips. Right. In, in, in spite of a normal uh, right. pressure gradient. So right. I think uh, uh, that's a wishful thinking. Right. I think, it, you know, endoscopists are cowboys. They want to do anything crazy, you know, take out the appendix, you know, through a stomach orifice, on and on and on, take out the gallbladder, et cetera. So they're just trying to push the, you know, the, the uh, uh, waterfront forward, and some, some of this stuff is going to fizzle. And Dr. Reynolds is one of the few people who get a real portal pressure, as you know, and, and when he was doing it, everybody had to hold their breath when he was actually measuring the portal pressure because he was concerned any kind of motion might disturb it. But most radiologists just look at the, look at the image and, and eyeball it. Grossman says you have to print out a strip, put calipers on it, measure uh, the pressure gradient, and nobody does it. I've tried to get radiologists to do it, they just won't. Yeah, it it's has not to be con practice. continuous measurement, not just a quick yeah. response. Yeah. So you um, have to really take it seriously to get it right. And radiologists are so concerned about coronary artery disease, vascular disease. Portal pressure measurement is the bottom of their priority list, in my opinion. No, I totally agree. In fact, uh, for a clinical trial, we had to go to a different hospital uh, on another, uh, the, the other campus about a mile away to get the radiologist to actually use inflatable balloons. Because at our hospital, they were so busy that they refused to do that. And if you ask any radiologist, so if you ever measure, if you ever send a patient for an HVPG, it would be worth asking them what they do. What they actually do, I think in 95 to 99% of cases, is they have a catheter and the catheter, they'll just shove it out as far as they can, right, once, the, the, once they're in the hepatic vein. And they have a box that gives you digital numbers. And they say, that's the wedge pressure. 
then they pull the catheter back, and then the box gives them another number, and that's the you know free pressure, and then they calculate the gradient. So I would say I would guess, and I'd like Bruce's comment that 95 to 99 percent of the HVPG we're getting when we order it is not done the way it was intended to be done. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree too. Right. Portal pressure is a joke, basically, and we need accurate, non-invasive measurement. <laughs> How many, you know, and the people who really do, port, really uh, advocate portal pressure measurement, the Barcelona, et cetera, they do it themselves. Freiburg, the hepatologist does the portal pressure measurement, and then they, they figure out how to do it right. But interventional radiology, just they don't care about it. And, and you talk to them, you give them the, the checklist, they don't change their approach. So it's not very useful. In um, treating ascites, I frequently find myself battling my nephrologists who go into a panic with the BUN and creatinine going up um, with the use of the diuretics. I'm wondering if you have any guidelines about how much tolerance we should have with the BUN and creatinine yep. going up yep. as we diurese. Yes, if, if now that... You have to ask for $150,000 from him. For right. Your guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> you, basically, uh, uh, you have to see if they have uh, parenchymal kidney disease. And many of the patients who get azotemic on diuretics have parenchymal kidney disease. And I will tolerate a BUN of 50 creatinine two and a half uh, in those patients if they're having good s sodium output. The patient doesn't care uh, what's going on as long as they don't need a tap. They really want to avoid tap. So anything to improve their blood pressure may drive the BUN creatinine down. And now that we have so many patients with diabetes, hypertension for years, they have parenchymal kidney disease, and, and that's a wild card that makes it more difficult. And I, I don't ever get a nephrology consult, ever, because I don't want their opinion, because they're wrong. <laughs> Most of the time, they're wrong. Right, ba basically they say hepatorenal, azotemia cirrhosis, they say hepatorenal before they even looked at any of the data, and that's not helpful. Uh, if, you know, interventional radiology can do a biopsy, so we don't even need nephrology for a biopsy anymore. So I don't want their opinion. And in Shiprock, I've told the team there, don't ask for a nephrology consult because you just get bogus advice. So I would extract your patient from the nephrologist, and you're the owner of that patient. Nephrologists only get a snapshot. They don't have long-term follow-up to, to realize they made a mistake. Whereas the, patient, the person who owns the patient <coughs> finds out from the patients over the years what they tolerate, what they don't tolerate. Yeah, patients do the teaching if we just pay close enough attention. So it's all about reducing tap frequency, in my opinion. 43 years, I had one patient drove herself to tap clinic. Every other patient, 1,000 plus probably, had a driver because they couldn't get behind the wheel. They were too confused to drive. And so you're wasting the uh, time of the driver and the patient. It usually takes them a half day. And if they, if they want albumin, and if they basically I offer it, and, and it requires they go to an infusion center, and they say, no, I'm going home. Forget the albumin. And the albumin's not needed. I think Minadrin should be given post-tap as per that study. Fabulous drug. Uh, I'm the only one pushing it. I'm the only one pushing Baclofen. I have no investment, that, you know, they're generic. But why not drive the pressure up over 82? The patient with parenchymal kidney disease can get a patarenal with a better blood pressure than a patient without parenchymal kidney disease. So we're seeing a different variety of, of hepatorenal where they have a higher pressure than in the old days with you know 90 or 80 over 60, 70 uh, over 40 kind of stuff. Now the parenchymal kidney disease patient who has very stiff vessels from long-standing hypertension may have a patarenal with a better creatinine. So it's all about blood pressure and urine sodium excretion. So if your urine sodium excretion is zero, despite maximal diuretic, tolerated diuretics, you stop the diuretics because they're not doing anything. You just drive the sodium down, potassium up. If you continue diuretics in patients with no urine sodium. But I've seen so many patients who were refractory, put on midodrine, and go back to diuretic sensitive again. Do you, do you find that 
I have found pretty much that the renal uh, dysfunction is completely reversible. Yeah, uh, yeah. sure. Is, is that sure. the panels? Oh yeah, it's, it's diuretic induced azotemia, and you have to be careful if you push diuretics too hard, the patient falls. There's a data on that from Carlos Guarner in Barcelona. Elderly patients, it's another risk factor. So cirrhosis in an elderly patient, high risk for fall. So you don't want to push them to dehydration with diuretics. So it's wet and wise or dry and demented, and we, we have to be cautious. It's all about the, the patient's outcome, avoiding TAP. So the new drugs and the procedures uh, that are being considered for approval by the FDA, TAP frequency and TAP volume is the main endpoint. And that's reasonable. Uh, they tend to ignore your sodium, et cetera. But uh, it's all about fine-tuning the drugs, basically. Tiny change may make a big difference. I was uh, one of the last batch of fellows lucky enough to be trained by Dr. Redeker. Yeah. And he loved the urine sodium. Yeah. The other thing he always said is that you look at the shins, and if you've lost your peripheral edema, you don't push the diuretics because you're going to pull from the kidneys. So yeah. he always, those were his two pearls. I actually wanted to just switch gears quickly and ask Chris a question. The Sil effects are a study. So um, one thing I'm not, I wanted to understand is, do you think that it's just not a potent FXR uh, agonist, or do you think that 12 weeks was just too short a time to see a significant decline in the ACFOS? And second, I know this came up at the ASLD, and I don't remember what you uh, said, but um, can you explain what happened with the placebo increase in the bile acids? <clears throat> Yeah, so uh, the, the second question is easier to answer because we actually did, don't know. We don't have a good explanation okay. for it. <clears throat> now, there was no change in urso dose, um, and the, um, the concentrations of total and primary bile acids were calculated both in terms of the proportion and the total amount after excluding the urso, so that was not an issue. Uh, so we just don't know. It's a small study and, you know, yeah. who knows. Uh, with regard to the efficacy, you're absolutely right. Um, the response is uh, it's dose-related, so it's suggested that maybe the dose was too low. Um, the uh, response was also not as good as we've seen with some of the other drugs. Yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, I suspect that uh, I don't think it was a question of duration because with all of these uh, FXRs, the peak response occurs within the first four to eight weeks. Right. Um, and we didn't see a loss of response. I suspect that it may have to do with uh, the differences in these molecules, because you know we have bile acid versus non-bile acids, uh, steroidal versus non-steroidal, and they have different properties in terms of their ability to activate FXR in the gut with regard to FGF19. So the short answer is I think it's more dose related, uh, not duration related, and your point about the bile acids is excellent because we don't have an explanation for it. All right, we're at the break. Um, we'll reconvene at 10 o'clock. Thank you.